Here you see a family of tigers. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six tigers are there. It's a family. They are how happily they are there. Their numbers are dwindling. There are only a few thousand tigers in the world. We people are nearly 800 crores. We have cut down their numbers. Where should they go? Where should they live? And here is a poster, you see, developed by the government of India, World Tiger Day, World Tiger Day. Here, tiger population rises to 2,226 from 1,411 in 2008. There is a slight increase because of a lot of efforts that the governments have put in in order to see that tiger number picks up. Tiger number picks up. It has picked up. But they are an endangered species. They are endangered. Their life is in danger. You do not know. Then these few thousands of tigers would vanish. See, these are the tiger uh, reserves in India. Tiger reserves. Karnataka has 406 of them. Uttar, uh, tigers, number of tigers, 406. Uttarakhand has 340 tigers. Tamil Nadu has 229 tigers. Madhya Pradesh has 208 tigers. Maharashtra has 190 tigers. The Sundarbans in Bengal has 76 tigers. You can count them in number. Fingers. See here. 30% rise has happened as per the since the 10, 2010 estimate. In the last 10 years, about 30% population rise has taken place. It's a green picture, no doubt. It has to be kept up. Kept up. There are 48 tiger reserves in India. Altogether, we have 48 tiger reserves. All tiger river reserves aim at provide them, providing them a good reserve, natural habitat, where they can live freely, enjoy and their numbers do pick up. Hunting is absolutely banned in these reserves. Okay, next. What is wildlife conservation? You see here, you see elephant herd here. They have elephant herd. Wildlife conservation is the practice of protecting endangered plant. Animal species, plants and animals which are in an endangered state, they are protected. That is what you call as conservation. Animal species and their habitats in an effort to maintain the ecological balance. We know it very well. Without all animals and plants, human survival is also not possible. It is all interdependent. It is a net. It's a web. We should understand the importance of plants and animals for the survival of this planet. How does the government conserve our forests and wildlife? What steps are taken? Let's see. The government lays down rules. Rules are laid down. For example, wild animals should not be hunted. Yes, it's a rule. Regulations are there. You cannot have a thoroughfare in these factories. And policies to protect our forests. Policies. No one can have agricultural land developed in a forest area. He cannot fell a forest and be put behind bars. Rules are very strict. People should understand. They should become responsible. They should understand well and see that government rules and regulations are brought into force. They get executed. And people should be able to understand the severity of the problem and act accordingly. Besides, it also earmarks rich flora and fauna habitats. Which are the areas in the country where you have a rich flora or a rich fauna? With different varieties of plants and animals being there. For example, Himalayan forest. 
There are lots of varieties of plants which you don't see them anywhere. Kashmir, you have such animals and plants there you do not find anywhere. Himachal Pradesh, another area where you have rich flora. All these have to be preserved. We can't allow them to just get washed out, cleared out. Our survival depends on their survival. Rich flora and fauna habitats as protected areas where the following activities are prohibited. In these reserve lands, reserve areas, certain activities which we normally take up elsewhere, they are all prohibited there. Let us see. Next. You can't cut down trees. Remember children, being responsible citizens of the country, we should remember all this. You cannot cut down trees in forests. Even elsewhere, you need permission from the local panchayat or the shildar, taluka board. Grazing cattle. You can't graze cattle wherever you like. There are areas where you can graze. If you allow them to graze wherever you like, the soil will become hard. All other plants die. It becomes a desert land later. Hunting. Absolutely banned. Hunting is banned. Black bucks are hunted. Deer are hunted. Bears are hunted. Even wild animals are hunted for fun. Tigers are hunted. Elephants are hunted. Plantation and cultivation. You can't cultivate in forest lands. You cannot invade forest land and convert it into cultivation by bribing officers, getting it registered in your name. All these are absolutely anti-national. Poaching. The moment we say poaching, we remember Virapan. He used to hunt lots of elephants he had hunted, nearly 2,000 elephants. Poaching is not permitted. Illegally killing them, capturing wild animals, this is what is called as poaching. Even today there are lots of people who are not understood responsibility and they do it for money. It is not permitted. Biosphere reserve. A biosphere reserve is an area which aims to conserve the biodiversity of the area. First of all, you should be able to recognize the biodiversity. What all animals are there, plants are there. How is that? The reserve area is very, very important. It needs to be reserved. As well as its culture. Culture. Tribals may be there. The tribals, they take a major role in protecting the uh, biosphere, that reserve. It may contain other protected areas within it. For example, Pachmadi Biosphere. Pachmadi. Reserve has a national park called the Satpura National Park. It is in the Satpura Ranges. And two wildlife sanctuaries are there called the Buri Wildlife Sanctuary and the Pachmari Wildlife Sanctuary. Those two are found in this area. They are developed in this area. Two wildlife sanctuaries. It is a biosphere. The Satpura range is a biosphere. Next. Biosphere reserves in India. There are 18 biosphere reserves in India, which are here you have one for birds. Birds. The birds have a free time here, there. They can survive. And you have the river there. They get plenty of food too. And man doesn't try to occupy that land. Moment the human element enters in, the reserve is destroyed. It's destroyed. So here in the map of India, you have a number of markings here where you have these biosphere reserves. Almost in all states you have. Some of the key reserves have been shown here. Okay, next. You have the list here. Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh, you have Achinukmar, Amar, 
Amar Kantek and uh, these are biosphere reserves there. It's in Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh. Then Agastya Malal Biosphere Reserve, Kerala and Tamil Nadu. Cold Desert, you have Machal Pradesh. Dibru, Salkova in Assam. Dihang, Dalbang in Arunachal Pradesh. Great Nicobar, Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Great Run of Kutch in Gujarat. Gulf of Manar in Tamil Nadu. Kanchenjunga in Sikkim, Manas in Assam, you have Nanda Devi Biosphere Reserve in Uttarakhand, Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve in Tamil Nadu, Kerala and Karnataka, Nokrek in Meghalaya, Pachmari Biosphere Reserve in Madhya Pradesh, that is the Satpura Ranges about which we discussed just now, Panna in Madhya Pradesh, then Sheshachalam Hills, that is in Andhra Pradesh, then you have Simlipal in Odisha and Sundarbans you have in West Bengal. These are all biosphere reserves in different parts of our country. Next, flora and fauna. See here, there is a photo of the Pachmari Biosphere Reserve in the Sapura Ranges. Hills are there, the valley is there and it's all a reserve area for animals and plants. No one disturbs them. Flora, plants found in a particular area are referred to as the flora of the area. Flora, plants, plants of the area. They are specially adapted to that particular climate. If you take them elsewhere and plant them, they may not be able to survive to that extent. For example, flora in the Pachmari Biosphere Reserve includes sal, sal trees, arjun, arjun trees, Next, you have teak here, teak, you have silver fern here, mangoes here, trees here. Next, see, that's all about flora. Now coming to fauna. Animals found in a particular area are referred to as fauna of that particular reserve or that area reserve or area. For example, fauna in the Western Ghats Biosphere, Pachmari Biosphere, Biosphere Reserve. It includes, see, in Agumbe you find King Cobra. It stands on its tail, it comes to my height, six feet. So it can hitch over a long range and it bites, it can bite over a long range. Uh, it nests, nesting habit. A very unique reptile it is. It builds a nest, 50 to 60 eggs it will lay and um, it is known, it is a well known reptile in the Agumbe ranges. Uh, let's see a blue bull, blue bull in the Sayyadris you find. Wolf, it is in the Pach Pachmari. Blue bull and wolf in the Pachmari. Next. Leopards, the uh, gorillas in the African desert, African forest, then the barking deer, these are in the Pachmari again, cheetah, chinkara, deer, a special variety of deer, chinkara, all these are found in the Pachmari reserves. Next. Endemic species. Endemic species are those that can interbreed with each other, then you call it a species. What is a species? Animals of a particular group which can interbreed. They cannot breed with other organisms, another species. Now that is you call it as a species. Within a particular Variety too, you may have different species. A group of living organisms that can interbreed, interbreed, are called species. It means that only members of one species can reproduce offspring that are fertile and give birth to future generations. So, the young ones, the babies, or the eggs that are laid, or babies to whom they give birth. 
depends on the members of a particular breed. They can interbreed. A dog cannot be crossed with a cat because dog is a different species, cat is a different species. So within a species, interbreeding is possible. It cannot happen beyond that. It means that only members of one species can reproduce offspring that are fertile and give, give birth to future generations. Members of a species look like each other. They all look like each other. You feel they are all relatives. They belong to one group and share many characteristics. Now what are endangered? Now this is one species. The herd. The deer herd. Endangered species. Species whose number diminished so much that they might face extinction. That means they may vanish from this earth. Such a threat is there. Fear is there. Are known as endangered species. Their number goes on dwindling, coming down, decreasing. And you feel, oh, this is a situation where this particular species may altogether disappear from this earth. Then you call it as a species under danger. Under the danger, the threat of total extinction. They become extinct. They become a story of the past. We won't have them alive anywhere. Now they are called as endangered species. They vanish off from the earth. There can be endangered animals as well as endangered plants. Plants too may get endangered. Animals too may get endangered. Endemic species now. Species of plants and animals that are exclusively found in a particular area are called endemic to that zone, state or country. You have a particular species. You find them only in one area in the world. You don't find them elsewhere. Then it is endemic. It is restricted to that area. Specifically you find only there. Nowhere else. State or country. The endemic species are not found anywhere else naturally. You can take them and keep them in a zoo. That doesn't mean you have been able to grow them. Naturally, they should be able to grow. If you take them and put them in the forest there, in another forest, they should be able to grow there. In spite of all Edward cities, they should be able to adjust well and grow. Next. For example, endemic flora for the Pachmari, uh, Pachmari Biosphere Reserve includes sal, and wild mango. Sal. The sal that grows there doesn't grow anywhere else. Or the wild mango variety you find in the Satpura ranges, you don't find anywhere else. You can't grow. It's got very well adapted to that area. Next. See here. Tigers. Tigers are an endangered species. Now, tigers which are found in the Sundarbans, you don't find them elsewhere. They are restricted to Sundarbans. It's endemic to that area. Anaconda is endemic to the Amazon river forest, Amazon forest in South America. You don't find them elsewhere. Bison, giant squirrel, flying squirrels, flying squirrels and giant squirrels you find in the Western Ghats, they are endemic. You can't grow them elsewhere. They have very well got adapted to the Western Ghats. Next. Now, wildlife sanctuary. See here, she is a conservationist. She has a monkey sitting on her shoulder. They have got very well adapted to each other. Lots of uh, people from world over, they put themselves into this main job of protecting the animals, protecting the endangered species, working for them. For years they stay in the forest, they work for these animals. Wildlife sanctuaries are reserved forests where wild animals are protected 
and provide it with suitable living conditions. You have to provide good conditions for their living and look after them. Unlike a zoo, animals in wildlife sanctuaries live in their natural habitat. See, in zoo, you bring animals from the forest and keep them in the zoo. But it is not a natural habitat. You have created it, you may feed it well, but still the animal may not feel itself comfortable in that cage what you have developed. So always we try to arrange for a natural habitat for, for, for them and are free to roam anywhere as they like. In the forest, in the natural habitats, they jump from tree to tree or they roam about, they move about and they enjoy life. Only in such circumstances they survive. People living in wildlife sanctuaries can graze livestock. People who live there, they are permitted to graze livestock if they have. No inhibition on that because they are tribals who live in those forests. Collect firewood or medicinal plants. If they need some medicinal plants, they can collect them and use it for their personal use. Collect firewood to kindle, to, for as fuel, they may need some firewood. To that extent, they can cut. They are permitted. But nowadays, government is trying to provide them with gas to see that they don't cut trees. Activities prohibited in wildlife sanctuaries include what are the activities that are prohibited that you are not supposed to take up? Killing. You can't kill animals. Poaching. Absolutely prohibited. Capturing animals. You can't capture animals. Selling and all these are out of question. You can't even catch animals and keep them in cages. These activities in wildlife sanctuaries are punishable by law. You are destined to get punished in case you break these laws. Next. See here, gharials. Gharials. They are endangered species. They are wildlife sanctuaries in India. Cheetahs. Indian wildlife sanctuaries have unique landscapes which include broad level forests, mountain forests and bushlands in deltas of big rivers. They protect several threatened wildlife species such as golden cat, pink-headed duck, black buck, white-eyed buck, gharials, marsh crocodiles, elephants, rhinoceros, python, etc. In wildlife sanctuaries, we pay attention in order to see that these animals which are on the verge of disappearance are protected. They are allowed to survive in natural circumstances. Next. Unfortunately, people encroach upon the land. In spite of law, <coughs> in spite of all inhibitions, people still encroach, invade of these protected forest areas and destroy them. They destroy. There are 543 wildlife sanctuaries in India. Altogether today, we have 543 wildlife sanctuaries. We are doing a human job, no doubt. Which include as many as 50 tiger reserves, which focus on the conservation of the tiger. 50 are meant only for conserving tigers. The tiger reserves work under Project Tiger, Project Tiger, that's the name given to the important step we have taken in order to protect tigers. All the activities come under Project Tiger. Jim Corbett, he was known, he was a known person in this area, and a sanctuary has been named after him, Jim Corbett. Was the first tiger reserve of India. Jim Corbett was the first tiger reserve. It is situated in Uttarakhand and is also the oldest national park in India. Even as the British were here in India, the Jim Corbett Sanctuary came up. It got founded. Project Tiger is a government initiative to protect tigers. Its objective was to ensure the survival and maintenance of the population of tigers in India. Next. 
Similarly, some of those wildlife sanctuaries are called bird sanctuaries as they focus on protecting birds. Kevalado National Park, for example, was a bird sanctuary before it attained the national park status. Some national parks focus on conserving a particular species, for example, Javai Leopard Sanctuary, it is in Rajasthan. National Park. National parks are large forest reserves that attempt to preserve the entire ecosystem, ecosystems within the area, including the landscape, flora, fauna, and historic objects of that area. Even if some monuments are there in the area, everything is taken care of. The landscape has to be preserved. We had to see that the forest grew well. So, all these aspects are taken note of. Next. See, Satpura National Park is the first reserve forest of India. Within this forest, you can find the finest Indian teak as well as rock shelters, which are evidence of the prehistoric human life in the area. You have these rock shelters too there, where the prehistoric man lived. You can see here on these rocks some of the pictures they had drawn, carvings they had made, they are found there. It is an indication that human beings lived in these rock shelters long, long ago. There are a total of 55 rock shelters in Pachmari Biosphere Reserve, which also feature rock paintings depicting figures of men fighting with animals, hunting scenes, dancing and playing musical instruments. So whatever human activities they had then, they had depicted them in the form of pictures, drawings, carvings, and they become an indication or a proof for the people today to know how they led a life. Many tribals are still living in the area. So tribals who live in such areas, they too need all the protection in order to see that the culture prevails. Next, national parks in India. There are 104 national parks in India. Top 10 of these national parks include Jim Corbett National Park, Uttarakhand, Kaziranga National Park in Assam, Gir Forest National Park in Gujarat, Sundarban National Park in West Bengal, Satpura National Park in Madhya Pradesh, Aravikulam National Park in Kerala, Pench National Park, Madhya Pradesh, Sariska National Park in Rajasthan, Kana National Park, Madhya Pradesh and Ranthambore National Park in Rajasthan. These are the top 10. Next. Why do animals become extinct? Why do they become extinct? What makes, us, makes them become extinct? Disturbances in the natural habitat of animals make it difficult for them to survive and hence become extinct. For example, dinosaurs. 65 million years ago, dinosaurs became extinct. But how do we know that they existed? We get their skeletons. We get the fossils. And these fossils and skeletons, what we get, they give us all details pertaining to their life, their stay, their body structure, the size. All these we come to know from the fossils we get make it difficult for them to survive and hence become extinct. Dinosaurs became extinct thousands of years ago, 65 million years ago, 65 million years. Why do we need to conserve animals? Why should we conserve them? Animals such as lizards, snakes, owls and bats play a particular role in an ecosystem. They help in maintaining its balance. You cannot deem any animal as not necessary. Any animal, even if it doesn't survive, it's all right. We can. All animals, they have their key role. They have a role to play in the global structure. They form a part of food chains and food webs. We need to conserve different life forms to make sure that the natural balance does not get disturbed. If one particular animal disappears from the globe, 
another particular animal will start increasing in its numbers because it is all a chain. It's a chain. If all the snakes are killed by a village, definitely the number of mice and rats that would increase, their number would increase because the mice and rats are the food of the snakes. Automatically their number increases. Next. What do we mean by an ecosystem? An ecosystem refers to the living organisms and non-living components of a place. You have the flora and the fauna and you have the non-living things too. The soil, the water, the air, the stones, rocks. Now putting these together, let's say including plants, animals, microorganisms, climate, soil, river delta, all these you put together and you call it as ecosystem, ecological system. Red data book, International Union of Conservation of Nature that is called as IUCN. It's an international organization for conserving nature, maintains a record of all endangered animals and plants in the world. They keep a register. They maintain a record of that in the world and calls it Red Data Book. It's called as Red Data Book. India also maintain, maintains its own Red Data Book, which keeps a record of all endangered plants and animals found in India. Next. The Golden Toad. The Golden Toad now makes the extinct as well as the extinct in the wild list of the IUCN red list. It's in the endangered list now. All frogs are not, but this red frog, this golden toad, the golden toad has an entry in the IUCN book. Because it has been considered as an endangered animal. There is a red data list too, which is also known as the IUCN red list of threatened species or IUCN red list, which classified all known plant and animal species into nine groups. Nine groups have been made. Extinct. No known individual of the species is alive. You call it as extinct. All animals of a particular species are no more. No more. They have disappeared from the earth. You call it as extinct. Extinct in the wild. No known individual of the species in the wilderness. They exist only in captivity. Only in the zoos we have a few animals. We have taken care of. They stay. They survive. But in the forest not a single animal is there. They are no more. You call it as extinct in the wild. Another group. Critically endangered species, species that are at extremely high risk of being extinct in the wilderness. Almost, they are on the verge of being extinct. This year, next year, it may happen. So, a dangerous level. So, lot of care has to be taken. Next. Endangered. Species that are at high risk of being extinct in the wilderness, you call them as endangered, vulnerable, Species that are at high risk of being endangered in the wilderness. They are in the wild, no doubt. But there is a possibility any day they may turn to be a species that is extinct. So you call it as vulnerable. Near threatened species that are likely to become endangered in the near future. Maybe in the next 5 years, 10 years. Nearly they are threatened. Then data deficient, least concern. Species which are found in abundance and is not at risk. Large number of animals are there of that species. There is no worry. There is no question of those animals becoming extinct. Because they are in large numbers. You call them as animals of animals or plants of least concern. Don't show any concern. Don't worry about them. They survive. That are deficient. Species about which we do not have enough data. You don't have data. data. Details you don't have. Still, you have to do a lot of research to access its extinction risk. 
how will it become extinct? What steps should be taken? You should collect details. That is data deficiency. You don't know much. You should put efforts to know quite a lot of things about that species. Not evaluated. Species which has not yet been evaluated on the criteria adopted by the IUCN. IUCN is saying, but still we have not been able to evaluate. We have not made a survey. We have not made a study. You call it as non-evaluated. Evaluation is an exam, a test. Species that fall in the critically endangered, endangered and vulnerable categories are also referred to as threatened species. All these come in the threatened species, which have the risk of becoming extinct one day. Next, migration now. See, Arctic tern is a bird which migrates from the south polar region to the north polar region and back. It is the bird which is known to make the longest migration. See, animals migrate. Daily migration is there. Seasonal migrations are there. But different variety is a big subject again. For reproduction purpose, even as seasonal changes take place, they migrate from one place to the other. Migration is the movement of birds, animals or humans over long distances to live in a new location permanently or temporarily. We go in search of jobs. Now that's also migration. Migratory birds are birds that fly to far away areas every year to avoid harsh and inhospitable weather conditions. Either the climate weather is harsh or the weather is inhospitable. They cannot live at all. Seasons have changed. So what do they do? They shift from that place. Go to another convenient place weather conditions in their natural habitat. They cover long distances to reach another land and lay their eggs. Birds move to far off lands in order to lay eggs. Why do they move? Because weather is inhospitable. The weather is not appropriate. They will not be able to survive in that weather. Then they move to another place. Okay. Now, recycling of paper. You see here, this is reuse, reduce and recycle. These are the watchwords or mantra of conservation of animals and plants. Conservation of animals and plants. Reuse the things. Reduce using them and recycle them. See, why recycle? Because one ton of recycled paper saves 24,000 gallons of water. Eliminates 3 cubic yards of landfill space. Eliminates 60 pounds of air pollution. Saves enough energy to power the average home for 6 months. Saves about 20 trees. Saves 4 barrels of oil. Please do your part. It's a request. Please join hands. Let us conserve. Thank you. Next. Why should we recycle paper? See, these are coniferous forests. We need to cut 17 full grown trees to make one ton of paper. 17 trees which have guts, very big, huge. They have to be felled for one ton of paper. That's why we are very particular today. We want to bring about a big change in the society, in the world, of changing over into digital system. We should stop using paper. If we stop using paper, we can, we can stop cutting forests. We have computers. We have the digital facility. Let us slowly shift over to that. We can easily reuse and recycle paper for five to seven trees. Reducing our consumption from 17, it will come down to seven. If you do that way, our paper can save trees and also save water and energy used to manufacture paper. So we should bring down the use of paper. 
consumption of paper. Besides, it can also help in reducing the use of harmful chemicals that are used to make paper. To make paper, you have to use chemicals. Now, those chemicals too can be saved. You need not use them. Reforestation is the opposite of deforestation. It is an opposite word, antonym. Here, we plant new trees to restock forests that have been destroyed. Wherever forests are destroyed, you plant trees, saplings and develop a forest there. In India, we have the Forest Conservation Act. That's the Forest Act we call, which aims to preserve and conserve natural forests and meet the basic needs of the people living in or near them. Next. Reforestation. See, we are all planting saplings. Can happen naturally or can be done artificially. If a deforested area is left undisturbed for some time, the forests grow again on their own. But it takes a lot of time. However, we cut more trees than the ones that grow on their own. Number of trees we cut is more in number. They don't grow once again at that rate. The growth rate is very slow. So better we take initiative to grow plants. Hence we should plant trees to promote reforestation. Ideally we should plant as many trees as have been cut down. If you cut one tree, you have to plant a tree. You have to make it up. Make up the loss. We should plant as many trees. Ideally, what can we do? Plant as many trees as possible had been cut down. And the new trees should be of the same species as the earlier ones. You can't have single species growth or you can, cannot have commercial growth of trees. There should be forests. There should be all kinds of trees mixed up. Okay. You see here, some of the great men and women who have really strived hard to grow forests. They have been given Padma Shri awards. Here you see, Jadav Mulai Pang. He is being honored by Abdul Kalam there. He is planting a sapling there. There are people who have served this society for years together, not one or two years. Their whole life they have sacrificed for this. Padma Shri Jado Malai Pang, the forest man of India, is an environmental activist and forestry worker. He is from Jorat, India, and single-handedly planted and nurtured a forest encompassing an area of 1360 hectares of forest he has grown. 1360 hectares across several decades along this sandbar of the river Brahmaputra. He was awarded Padma Shri, the fourth highest civilian award in India in 2015 for the feat. The forest he planted is called Molai Forest after him. His own name has been kept for that Molai Forest. Here, Tulsi Gauda, she is one who has served in Karnataka. Here you have Salu Timakka. You have heard about her. Her entire life here she has spent for putting up saplings and growing there. See, this is the Padma Shri Award. Ordinary man, common people too are being honored. They are not the ones who have post-graduation or PhD or anything. They are ordinary people who understood their responsibility and did their work for the growth and development of the country and conservation of nature. So we have to salute those people. So thank you. We close here.